What up, ding-dongers? My name is Michael, and today we will be listing off the eight breeds of cats that might be able to learn to play the banjo. Number five might surprise you. This is Michael's Toys. Thank you for tuning in to the Dong Channel. It has been a wild ride this year. I've had a lot of fun. Uh, I think last year in total, I made like four videos, but this year, because of Dong, I've made like more than 20. We're talking relativity, Morse code, homonyms, density balls. I built every strictly convex deltahedron. I also listed off prime numbers for three hours. That was a treat for me, and I really hope it was for you. Now, should those videos all have gone on Vsauce 1? Maybe. I don't feel like they were big enough, but they were certainly fun, and without the Dong channel, I wouldn't have made them. So thanks for tuning in here. Exciting news is that Minefield is out on Vsauce 1 right now, and for this season, I was able to convince YouTube to make two of this season's episodes free for everyone to view. The first one about the cognitive trade-off hypothesis, which I hope you've already seen, and the fourth episode, which is about the Stanford Prison Experiment. Pretty exciting stuff. But we're here today to talk about the Mandelbrot set. It is a famous set of complex numbers named after mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot. I got together with our designer, John Laser, and we designed this poster. It is a beautiful thing. It imagines the Mandelbrot set as an island of finite land and infinite coast. It has all kinds of information about the set and it imagines all the different features of the set as actual geographic features. Point is, what is the Mandelbrot set? Well, today we're going to talk about that. First of all, you may have uh, noticed that I said complex numbers. What is a complex number? Well, it's a little bit complex. Just kidding, it's not really. Uh, we all know and love the number line. It's a way to visualize all of the real numbers on a line, a one-dimensional line like this, where zero can be placed somewhere like that. And then numbers like, uh, you know, one might be here, two might be here. Over here, we might have negative one. Ooh, I can imagine three being there and four there. This contains all real numbers, not just the integers, but all rational numbers. For instance, right here, well, that's gonna be uh, a half. Well, it's actually gonna be one and a half, 1.5. The ratio of every circle's circumference to its diameter in Euclidean space is about right, I don't know, there. That's pi, 3.1415 approximately. Uh, the square root of one. It's a real number, it's on here, it's just one. One times one is one. But what isn't here, well, is a lot of stuff. For example, where is the square root of negative one? Where on this real number line is that number? Well, here's the problem. Any real number times itself is positive. Negative one times negative one is just one. Negative two times negative two is four. So the square root of negative one may not exist, but mathematicians have found it very useful, and very powerful to say that the square root of negative one is a number. It's a number called i, i for imaginary. And probably someone said, yeah, but i is a letter, not a number. And they were like, now you can look as hard as you want at the real number line, you will never find i on that line. But we can put i on the line by drawing an axis that is perpendicular to the real number line. This way, instead of saying, well, is i to the right or left of zero, we can just say, how about i is above zero? There's i, which means that the same distance in the other direction from zero, we have negative i. And then right here, we've got two i. 3i, and so on. What we now have is not just a real number line, but a complex number plane. A complex number is a combination of a real number and a complex component that involves i. Actually, every real number is a complex number. Here's an example of a complex number just to get us started. If I pick any point on this plane, it will be a complex number. This one right here, this is two, the real number two plus i. It's one up from zero. This is two plus i. A number like this one right here, that point, that point is negative one, that's the real component, and the imaginary component is three i. Negative one plus three i is this number right there. 
Every number here is a complex number, and it is these numbers that either belong or don't belong in the Mandelbrot set. By picking all the numbers that belong and plot plotting them on a complex plane, what we wind up with is a beautiful shape known as the Mandelbrot set visualized like this. If you look on our poster, this right here is the imaginary axis, and this is the real axis. How do you know if a number, a complex number, belongs to the Mandelbrot set or not? Whether it is a piece of land on this island, or if it's like out here in the ocean, not part of the set. I could spend a bunch of time talking about Julia sets, and we could start more generally, but I wanna go right to Mandelbrot. So let's talk about functions. A function is just a mapping from numbers to some other numbers. And the function that we're going to be using to determine whether a number belongs to the Mandelbrot set or not looks like this. It's a function of a variable z such that its value at z equals z itself squared plus c, where c is any complex number. C is the number that we have located on this plane and we wanna know whether it belongs in the set or not. What you have to do though, is you have to start this with Z equal to zero. And you need to iterate this function. And if the value that we keep getting out just grows bigger and bigger without bound, the number is not in the set. If however, the number sort of stays somewhat small and doesn't grow to infinity, then the number belongs in the set. Let's do some examples. We begin by applying this function to z, where z equals zero, and let's say that our complex number uh, is going to be uh, the number one. How about that? We'll just try this. Remember, one is a real component, but there's this uh, kind of invisible imaginary component because we can imagine that one is just equal to one plus zero times i. Anyway, uh, what is f of z? Well, we have to begin with z equal to zero. That's the rule for creating the Mandelbrot set. z squared, zero squared, all right? And then we add one, which is c in this case. We wanna know if one is in the set. So, zero squared plus one. Perfect, what does that equal? Well, zero squared is zero plus one is one. Wonderful, now we iterate this function, meaning our result becomes our new value of z. So now z is equal to one. So what is this function at one? Well, if, uh, if uh, we need z squared, that means we're now using one squared and we're adding c, which is one, and the answer we get is one squared, one, plus one, which is two. Now this is our value for z, two. All right, so what is f of two? Well, that's two squared plus one, which is for five. Uh-oh, all right, let's plug this one back in. Now z is equal to five f of five equals five squared plus one. Five squared is 25 plus one is 26. My gosh, you guys, this is just gonna keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It is going to grow without bound. And so one is not part of the Mandelbrot set. But now let's try this for the complex number negative one, which can also be thought of as negative one plus zero i. Now we begin with f of z, where z equals zero, zero squared, all right, cool. And then we add c, which is negative one. So we're adding negative one. What does this give us? Well, zero squared is zero. And then we're adding a negative one, which means we're subtracting one, so we get a negative one. Okay, so now our new value of z is negative one. It originally was zero, now it's negative one. So what is f of negative one? Well, it is negative one squared, since we need to do z squared. And then we need to, of course, add c, which is in this case still negative one. Negative one squared is one, plus negative one, one minus one equals zero. Uh-oh. Now, I think you can already see what's about to happen. We now need to plug in zero as our next value of z, but we already did that. We already did that. We know that zero squared plus a negative one equals negative one, we're just gonna oscillate back and forth between negative one and zero. Negative one and zero forever. This will not grow without bound. Therefore, how you like that infinity symbol? It probably annoyed you that I drew it like this. I just did that for kicks because on Michael's toys, you never know what's gonna happen. Okay, so we can see that because at negative one, this function does not 
grow without bound as we iterate, negative one is part of the Mandelbrot set. And sure enough, if we look on our little graph here, not graph, our map, negative one, which is actually the very center of the main disk here, that's certainly part of the Mandelbrot set. Now, let me point out a couple of the features I love here. Uh, right here, uh, there's a point at uh, the real component is negative three quarters and the imaginary component is zero. This is a single point. It is the only point that belongs to the set that is along this line that intersects the real axis right at negative three quarters. That I call a point bridge. It is an infinitely thin bridge, perfect for brief <laughs> romantic walks, because it's just a single point. Okay, anyway, we've got other things like the seahorse coast. Beautiful seahorse shapes adorn this side of the main cardioid. This is a cardioid, this wonderful heart shape. You can find cardioids all over. Uh, for instance, on some of the baby brats. The baby brats are very similar looking to the entire Mandelbrot set. Uh, the main disc, okay, we talked about that, but on, on, on the Seahorse Coast side, we also have this main disc spiral coastline. It's a beautiful place. I really wish it was real. Now, a really cool thing that this poster points out is that while the perimeter of Mandelbrot Island may be infinite, but its area is not. We're not exactly sure what its area is. We do know that a circle can completely enclose the set that is centered at the origin with a radius of two. But Right now, our best estimate for its area is, let me see here, about 1.506484 square units. So there you go. Maybe someday we will find a way to find the exact area. It may not be rational. Uh, in fact, it might not be, I don't know. Boy, I have so much more to learn. Such an inspiring poster. Really, really love it. Thanks to John for helping me design this. I love this poster. If you want it, well, you gotta subscribe to the Curiosity Box. This poster comes in the latest box, Box 10. We only have a few hundred left. If you're a subscriber, you got it, or it's coming. If you haven't subscribed, we have a few left. We always make a few thousand more than we have subscribers, but the only way to be guaranteed that you will get our latest inventions and discoveries and favorite math and science objects, you need to be a subscriber. I am loving working on this box. So far, we have raised nearly $150,000 for Alzheimer's research. It's awesome. Lots more facts on this poster, a lot of cool things in this most recent box, including this shirt, which uh, I wanted to wear in the episode, but uh, Jake took mine. This is his, which is a small, and I'm not gonna try to fit into this. Just kidding, this is me wearing the small. <sighs> How you like that? Mm! Kraken, Kraken Mare Lunar Park. There's a moon of Saturn that has liquid hydrocarbon lakes that literally have waves. They're only like a fraction of a centimeter large, but I mean, you could surf that, right? So we designed this shirt that's like a vintage National Parks poster imagining that uh, Kraken Mare, the, the, one of the big lakes on the on, on Titan, Saturn's moon, was a, was a park, which could actually happen in the future sometime. I think this really tight shirt makes gravity stronger, or it just makes me cooler. It's like, look at me. I'm like, I don't care. I sit the way I want. Also, a puzzle. Now, the inventor of this puzzle called it, uh, I think, Foursquare, I believe. Uh, I got a copy. I loved it. And uh, the point, of course, is to get these uh, pieces out. But after I sort of, um, you know, solved it and learned its wiles, I said, whoa, we need to print I-E-N on the bottom, I-E-N, you see that? Why is that printed on the bottom of this puzzle? It won't make any sense until you solve the puzzle, and even then it might not. I'm excited to see what you guys think about that puzzle. There's obviously many more things in the box, including, woo boy, I can't show you this actually. This is a prototype of a product coming out in the next box, box 11. Can I, I don't wanna give away what it is. Actually, I can do whatever I want, but I choose not to. Oh, that's nice. This is the only clue I'll give you. Do you hear that? All right, hopefully that titillated you, I don't know. Um, I don't wanna show it off because I think the final product is gonna be a little bit different. Um, but the point is that the Mandelbrot set is beautiful. We actually had a giant version of this poster made to put up in our office, 
and it's a beaut. You can celebrate mathematics and new discoveries and put this up in your room or dorm room or um, keep it in your car for reference during uh, when you're in traffic. I don't know your life. Point is, I do love you and I'm glad you are here watching today. And as always, thanks for watching.